Look at these seams. Ah, well, it's a, certainly a change from the concrete jungles many of us in Asia work in. This is the beauty of Mongolia, all that unspoiled grassland and nomadic living in yurts, the goat herding. But under the pastoral idol lies a lot of very rich natural resources, which is really a key to Mongolia's attraction to a lot of foreign uh, investment. In fact, uh, Dr. Mark Mobius, our very good friend on the program, I should say, from uh, Templeton, liked it so much he devoted an entire chapter very recently, uh, during, uh, amidst his most recent travels in Asia, on his blog and wrote, there are many reasons for us to return to the land of Genghis Khan, of, uh, one of which, of course, is compelling investment opportunities over the next year and even beyond that. On the same blog, though, he also laments uh, issues uh, that uh, struck him as uh, an environment which felt very post-USSR, post-Soviet. Uh, infrastructure needs a lot of work, obviously. And in fact, he also uh, gets the sense, he says, that the Mongolian government seems to be grappling with a certain post-Soviet nostalgia combined with a fear that they could be ripped off by foreigners. So got to be careful uh, when balancing this whole delicate uh, situation. Our guest uh, joining Brad Zip and myself is uh, Genzurig Alzabayar, president of the Mongolian Financial Markets Association, also the CEO of Prime Insurance, the biggest property insurance company in Mongolia. And he happens to be in Hong Kong. Genzurig, nice to be, nice to see you on the show. Nice Welcome. to see you. Nice to see you. Um, <clears throat> people recognize that there's a lot of opportunity um, in Mongolia, but somebody like uh, Mark Mobius, who loves, you know, to kind of spend time on the ground and get to know the real people and just see what's going on uh, beyond the PowerPoint presentations is that there are a lot of little issues that, uh, you know, it feels like, uh, feels a, almost like Siberia, like post-Soviet era in in some way. So wh how ripe is Mongolia? Well, I've seen the blog myself. Oh, you have too. seen the blog. Okay, well, you know what I'm talking about then. Yeah, so uh, basically uh, th there is uh, what we call a little bit much democracy Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the, the reason why we are a little bit lagging Kazakhstan, for example, is because we are uh, the true democratic state in this certain region and uh, there are 76 people uh, in the parliament trying to decide to reach consensus mm -hmm. on every different interests. So that's why it's taking a little bit more time and that's why some people are referring there are some little issues. Mm -hmm. But I think in the longer run, it's the true frontier, new frontier of investment. Okay, so, well, the, uh, the, 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 of course, the consensus uh, of democracy can mean that it takes a little more time to come to decisions, but you're involving more people rather than somebody just handing down orders from the top. Definitely. We'll leave the political discussion to later. But um, when one thinks of Mongolia, it tends to be mining. Hundreds of millions of investment, which has either been committed or in the years to come will be committed to going into the mining space. But surely Mongolia is more than just the stuff in the ground, correct? Correct, definitely. When you, when you see the, uh, the recent trend, for example, Louis Vuitton just opened their 64th, 65th store and Zegna and Hugo Boss following and there is a potential retail sector, although the number of people, the population is only 2.7, 2.8 million. Mm -hmm. And also there is a growing sector for infrastructure. For infrastructures means transportation, the road built, we, we need to build lots of roads. Mm -hmm. And there is also growing sector for manufacturing and also different types of uh, food uh, processing. I'm, I'm talking about meat exporting and also agriculture because mm -hmm. Mongolia is the the largest land per capita country in the, in the, in the world. Mm -hmm. How do you invest in those spaces, though? It has to be on a direct basis, on a private basis. The, you can't do it through portfolio investment, correct? I mean, you have to negotiate these deals one at a time with individual participants. Yeah, definitely. The capital markets development is at its early stage, mm -hmm. but uh, the people, the investors could look at into private equity opportunities because there are lots of medium-sized companies who are quite willing to take greater risk and who, who are in need of capital. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think, in my opinion, in next two, three years, Mongolian capital market will be fully integrated with the global one, mm -hmm. uh, becoming it, it feasible to exit the international investors by doing IPOs mm -hmm. on the local exchange or how, even coming to Hong Kong. How much participation is there in the development of the financial infrastructure? outside participation in 
the local financial infrastructure? Well, actually, we have uh, quite a number of foreign-owned banks. Uh, we have uh, some two or three Russian-owned banks, mm -hmm. and we have some interest. We used to have some American invested bank, and mm -hmm. which they exceeded. And uh, as you know, we have this uh, euro bond issue issued by uh, Mongolian bank, and uh, now people, lots of people, are coming to country to invest in financial sector, which is also one of the interesting sectors aside the the prominent mining sector. Mm -hmm. Brad, uh, does Mongolia ever <coughs> pop up on the uh, on the radar screen for any of the people that you do consulting work for? Um, certainly, I think for some of the emerging market hedge funds, mm -hmm. they're going to focus and look at Mongolia for some of the natural resources that mm -hmm. they have. Mm -hmm. I think, Bernie, is, is you think about some of the opportunities that are out there in emerging markets. We have to remember that Mongolia, uh, three, five years from now, can easily be some of the Eastern Europe opportunities of six, seven years ago. Mm -hmm. So uh, we always need to take into consideration the people like Mark Mobius and some of the other people who fo focus on these markets as long-term investments. We'll get on the ground and take a look at what are some of the resource capabilities, how people are going to think about uh, the development of those markets longer term. Mm -hmm. And I think as they took a look at the Russian states, uh, Kazakhstan uh, is a good example, as our guest has talked about, mm -hmm. and to think about what are the structures in those uh, uh, countries, uh, those are good opportunities that people are going to be thinking about as we look into 2018, 2020, when the opportunities really uh, come about. Yeah. The, does the mindset need to change? Let me, let me, let me read one short extract from Dr. Mobius. He's, uh, an American company uh, was, work, was mining coal on the Chinese border. They wanted to build a rail link to, to China to uh, basically export and move the stuff faster. But the government insisted they use the Russian gauge. Uh, of rail uh, systems to connect to the Trans-Siberian Railway, but it doesn't mesh that well with the Chinese. There does need, need to be a certain compromise there, doesn't there? I mean, there does need to be some change in, in mindset in your country. Well, actually, recently, uh, one prominent Russian politician were quoted as saying, we need to take Mongolian example, because Russia exported lots of uh, raw materials without processing it into a, a finished product. So mm -hmm. what Mongolia is trying to do uh, f for as setting in set in this example right. is try to establish those large factories mm -hmm. to process the, they, the, those lots of uh, natural resources and to, to, to become the finished product right. so that 's why mm -hmm. Mongolian government insists okay. to follow the uh, na national grid lines okay. I mean, appreciate your time okay thanks for sharing thoughts